I'm Tim Brewster, Senior Pastor of First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. Welcome to this service of worship. I'm glad you've chosen to join us in this broadcast of our 11 o'clock worship service. And I hope you can join us in person at one of our services at 8.30 in the chapel, 9.30 in the sanctuary, 11 o'clock in the sanctuary, and at 11.11 in Wesley Hall. On behalf of the whole congregation of First United Methodist Church, I welcome you. Good morning. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. everybody felt welcomed this morning. If you are here and you've been wanting to join your membership with the membership of this congregation, there should be a today card in the front, in front of you in the pew pocket. If you would sign that and bring it up as we sing our closing hymn, we would be happy to welcome you into the life of this congregation. There are several announcements this morning. I'd like for you to look those over, our flu shots. We have the Halloween carnival, new academy classes, registering for November. Also, you see announcements there about our Nothing But Nets campaign. Th throughout the month of October, we've been focusing on Africa. We had a program with uh, Dr. Brewster and Brooks Harrington on their recent trips to Africa. We'll have a movie next Wednesday night and a book review the following Wednesday. Throughout this whole month, we're also doing a special emphasis on the Nothing But Nets campaign, and you're going to hear more about that in our worship service, but I would like to highlight that for you. And if you'll promise me that you'll read those announcements in the bulletin, I won't go over those individually. But please do note that we do have many things happening here, not just to keep you busy, but to serve others and to enrich your life. And now let our worship begin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts.
Let us pray. God of grace and glory, we thank you that you judge us not by the perfection of our actions, but by our readiness to live boldly by faith. Help us as individuals and as a congregation to trust you and follow where you lead, that in Christ your name may be glorified in all the earth. Amen. Long ago, a man did travel from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among a band of robbers, left him for dead beside the road. The only soul who had come was a stranger to God's chosen race was one who had the heart of Jesus and he saved this man from a wretched fate one man saw I see a man in desperation out on the streets most every day but like so many other people I turn my head the other way who will show shelter from the cold then I'm reminded of the story that Jesus told so long ago Jennifer Coggins, and I'm a member of this congregation as well as the Director of Humanitarian Services for the Central Texas Conference. Um, I have some assistants from the youth department that are on their way up here to uh, help me with a demonstration. And I'm here to speak to you today about my recent experience in Africa with Zoe Ministry, which is a United Methodist uh, organization that cares for AIDS orphans in Africa. But first I want to give you a statistic. Um, and let this wash over you for a moment. Every 30 seconds, a child dies from malaria. Every 30 seconds. Killed by a preventable disease carried by mosquitoes that's been eradicated in many parts of the world, but still infects nearly 500 million people each year. It's the number one killer of children worldwide. 
I recently had the privilege of serving in Zambia on a medical mission team and saw the effects of malaria firsthand. I have so many stories that I could tell you about children we served and the faithful people with whom we served. The 15 pastor's wives feeding 300 AIDS orphans two meals each day in one of the most dismal slums in the world. Mrs. Doreen, who sold dried fish in order to provide for her daughter, her granddaughter, and the six orphans that lived with her. My new friend, 10-year-old Priscilla, whose brilliant smile shone through her tattered clothes and her malnourished body as we danced and played outside of a community center in Livingston. The heartbreak that our team felt knowing that we couldn't treat case after case of malaria because unfortunately our medication for treatment was stolen soon after our arrival because of the desperation in the country. Our first day of work was in the slum of Missisi, which is just outside of Zambia's capital city of Lusaka. We drove into Missisi on bumpy dirt roads past garbage-filled cholera pits and concrete homes that were roofed with corrugated metal and scraps of wood and cardboard, whatever the residents could find. As we set up our clinic, children who were seeking whatever human touch they could get lined up to see us. We interviewed child after child who complained of headaches and sometimes fever, both symptoms of malaria. Parents, I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine your child coming to you with a complaint of a headache. It happens, right? And now I want you to imagine that both you and your child assume that this headache is caused by a life-threatening disease that kills almost one million people each year. The four youth holding this bed net are symbolic of the four children who have died from malaria in the short two minutes that I've been speaking to you. It's really an overwhelming um, visual. But there is hope. One youth underneath the net is represent, represents a child who will not die from malaria. And this is where you come in. This is where we all can make an impact. We're not helpless in the face of this deadly disease. We can support United Methodist organizations like Zoe Ministry that provide essential medications to treat malaria and other diseases of poverty. We can also support uh, the Nothing But Nets campaign, which provides insecticide-treated bed nets that can save the lives of a family of four. One $10 donation goes fully toward the purchase, distribution, and education about the use of these bed nets. One of these t-shirts um, is $20. You can buy it at nothingbutnets.org, or you can buy it at Cokesbury, which is the United Methodist bookstore. Um, and $10 of, of that um, purchase goes to buy a bed net. And I'm proud to say that since June, our conference has raised over $140,000 for the Nothing But Nets campaign. At annual conference, Dr. Brewster pledged that our church would provide funding for at least 1,000 bed nets. And that amounts to 4,000 lives saved. And this is just our congregation. The work that our mission team did in Zambia was just a drop in the bucket. We knew that. The purchase of one bed net is also a drop in the bucket. But as my Zambian friend Constance told our team, we can take heart because eventually that bucket will be filled up by all those drops. And it'll only take one drop to cause that bucket to overflow. Thank you very much. And thank you. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your steadfast love in the morning. And your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute and the harp. To the melody of the harp. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work.
It's always a joy in the life of a congregation when we are celebrate the sacrament of holy baptism. And I'd ask the Wright family if they would bring their son forward. Brothers and sisters in Christ, baptism is a sign to us of the love and the grace of God, a love that is given to us not on the basis of anything that we are or have done, but simply that the God who brought us to life loves us and accepts us. This is especially evident in the baptism of little children, as we remember the words of Jesus when he said, let the children come to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And I ask you now, as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? Yes. And do you promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? Yes. And will you nurture Jeffrey Edward in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Jeffrey Edward, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, if you'll place your hands on him also. Jeffrey Edward, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll borrow him for just a minute here. Jeffrey Edward is the newest member of the household of faith, and we as a church family pledge ourselves, along with his parents, to do all that we can to help nurture and care for him and to teach him the things of God so that as he grows up among us, he will come to the place in his own life where he will stand at this or some other altar and make his own profession of faith in Christ. And all this is God's wonderful gift offer, offered to us without price. Let's respond. With God's help, we will, we so, will so order, order our, our lives after, after the, the example, example of Christ, Christ that, that Jeffrey Edward, Edward surrounded, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and, confirmed and strengthened in the, the way, way that, that leads to life eternal. eternal. Come on down for our time together. We're going to meet in our usual spot right there. Come on down. You know what to do. Down a little bit more. Let's make some room for our friends. Let's scoot all the way down this way. Everybody scoot. 
And a little bit more. We got, we got a lot of friends today. Come on down. Good. This is a good problem to have. Good morning. I thought I would start by telling a little story. And all stories, of course, start with those four magic words. Do you know how the, the best stories start with? Once upon a time. Well, let's try that again. You start the story. Once upon a time. Okay, and I'll take it from here. Once upon a time, there was a mommy, and she had three kids, and they were known as the Brewster triplets. <laughs> there was Timmy, and Tommy, and little Cynthia. And they loved their mommy, and their mommy loved them. Well, one day, they went to the park to go play. Well, it wasn't very long before all of the Brewster triplets started to get little boo-boos. Well, little Timmy thought he could fly, and he went down the, sw the slide as fast as he could and thought he was flying, and then crashed and skinned his knee. And he went to Mommy, Mommy, I, I skinned my knee. And, and Mommy said, there, 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 there. And she kissed his knee. She said, better? Uh-huh. And then he ran off to play some more. Well, about that time, little Tommy came up, and he had walked a little too close to the swing set, and one of the swings had bonked him right in the head. He went, Mommy, I got too close to the swings, and one bonked me on the head, and I think my hair is broken. <laughs> and his mommy patted him on the head and kissed his head. Does that feel better? Uh-huh. Well, all this time, little Cynthia had been playing in the playground right there in the sandbox, and an ant had crawled up and bit her on the arm. <laughs> she would cry to my mom and mommy, and it bit me on the arm. If that's my arm, going to fall off? No, it's not going to fall off. And mommy rubbed her arm and then kissed it. Is that better? Uh-huh. And Cynthia ran off, and then she thought for a second, and she came back and put her arms around her mommy and said, thank you, mommy, and gave her a big hug. And you know what? That made her mommy feel really good. And her mom didn't use any medicine or a shot or anything like that, but they believed that those kisses made them feel better, and it did. But that's not the end of the story. That night, right before they were about to go to bed, they all remembered at the same time, <gasps> We forgot to say thank you to mommy. She took us to the park and was so nice and made us feel so good when we had our boobas and we didn't say thank you. So Timmy and Tommy and Cynthia hatched a plan. And they whispered, whish, 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 whish. Well, then they went to bed, but they could hardly sleep because the next morning they got up very early and they snuck into the kitchen. They were gonna make breakfast for their mommy. And they made everything. There was Cocoa Puffs, and Pop-Tarts, and Goldfish Crackers, and Teddy Grahams, and Chocolate Milk. And they were sitting at the table, and that's when they waited. They were waiting for Mom to come down the stairs and come in so they could surprise her. And they waited, and little Timmy wanted to help himself to a Goldfish Cracker, and, Timmy, and Tommy said, no, no, wait till Mommy comes in. And just about then, their mom walked in through the door and all of the Brewster triplets stood up and they sang this song to their mom.
Now stay standing up, stay standing up. You have a homework assignment again. Oh. You did so great on your last homework assignment. Here's your homework assignment for tomorrow morning. When you get up and you see your mom or your dad, the first thing I want you to say to them isn't, oh, what's for breakfast? We have breakfast. I don't want to go to school. I want you to look them right in the eye and I want you to sing, thank you, thank you. And if they say thanks, but for what? And you can tell them just for being you. And while we're saying thank you, why don't we say thank you to God who makes all this possible. I'm going to teach you a very short prayer. Have you ever been stuck at the dinner table where your parents say, okay, would you, would you say grace? And you're like, uh, 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 here's a really short, simple prayer that is just right and God will love it. So let's bow our heads. Repeat after me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. And that is just right. Yay. See y'all next time. Bye-bye. No more photos, Grandpa. Let's rise and affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit, we trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. come to you this morning with all kinds of needs and desires, gracious God. A routine, a loneliness, a searching, a joy. Whatever our reasons, somewhere, we acknowledge that our hearts long for you. We want to know if you are there. We want to know if you are real. We want to know if you can make a difference. So hear those prayers of our hearts, the prayers we do not express to anyone else, 
the prayers we hesitate even to bring to you. God of hope, in our most desperate moments, when answers either do not come or do not suffice, you remain. Grant us a trusting spirit. Help us to trust in beauty, to trust in kindness and in love expressed in acts of justice, all reflecting your presence in our midst. Our very being cries out to know you, and our lives must then lean on what we cannot ha have except through trust in your steadfast love. And it is gratitude that guides us. So then we thank you for your abundant grace. We thank you for small acts of kindness. We thank you for ones who stand against the many to speak for those who are without voice. We thank you for those who bring healing and offer a word of peace. We thank you for never giving up on us, for never leaving us abandoned, for a love we cannot imagine. And we thank you for these truths that satisfy in ways that laws and doctrines never could. And so with that confidence, we lift our prayers for all who suffer, for all who are lost, for all who worry. We pray for this world and for leadership that can risk efforts toward a peaceful resolution. And we pray for your church that it might truly speak a word of hope to all individuals and to this world that you love. For we ask this in the name of Christ, who told us to join our voices together in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. New Testament reading for this morning is taken from the 17th chapter of Luke's Gospel, verses 11 through 19, which is found at page 80 of the New Testament in your pew Bibles. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And this man was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, 
Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. God speaks to us truly through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. And now will you please rise and join in singing the hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus, at page 189 of our hymnals. One word of instruction about Nothing But Nets campaign. If you want to give uh, to that, make your check out to the church, place it in one of the offering envelopes and mark it clearly Nothing But net, Nets. Um, or you can write that in the memo line on your uh, check to indicate that the gift is to go to Nothing But Nets. And I hope you'll participate in that very important uh, way of, um, of saving lives and expressing the love of Christ in a concrete way. I want us to think this morning for a few minutes about gratitude. Many years ago, when Mark Twain was at the height of his career, it was well known he made $5 per word in his articles in magazines and journals, a huge sum of money in those days. He received a letter at one time from a young man who said, Enclosed is five dollars. Please send me your best word. He responded with a one-word one telegram, thanks. <laughs> it probably was his best word. What an important word that is. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate you. I'm grateful for you. 
And I believe it goes beyond words. It's true. When we go to another country, speaks a different language, we learn to say two things, don't we? Hello and thank you. Because we want to be sure and express gratitude. We know how important it is to say thank you and to receive words of thanks and gratitude, appreciation. But sometimes we forget to say thanks. And our story today in the Gospel of Luke is an account of Jesus doing an amazing thing in the lives of ten people who were lepers. It's hard for us to imagine what it meant to be a leper in first century Palestine. And what it meant was you were completely isolated, lonely, away from everybody else because the law required it. A leper is to separate himself from others and must go around whenever in the presence of anyone else must shout, unclean, 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 just so everyone knew that you were a leper and they were to keep their distance. Leprosy referred to not just Hansen's disease uh, as we know it today, but to a much wider range of skin conditions, disfiguring in one way or the other. People with leprosy were isolated. And so what could they do but band together? They couldn't be with their parents. They couldn't be with their children, brothers, sisters, friends, any family. And so they would stay together and often had to beg. Here they were by the side of the road waiting for someone to come along that might uh, throw some money in their direction on the lookout for someone so that they would shout the obligatory unclean. And then one of them spotted Jesus. And they began to talk among themselves, isn't that Jesus of Nazareth, the, the teacher, the healer? And they started shouting something other than unclean. They started shouting, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, go and show yourselves to the priests. And they knew what that meant. They knew it meant possibly, miraculously, when they got to the priest, the priest, who was the only person who could do it, would declare them clean, cleansed, whole, healed of their dread disease. And as they made their way, they were cleansed. One of them turned around and went back and fell at the feet of Jesus to say thank you. And Jesus said, were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give thanks but this foreigner? Because you see, the one who had fallen at Jesus' feet was a Samaritan. One who was a leper in more ways than one, at least as far as the Jews were concerned because Samaritans had nothing to do with Jews, and Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. But interestingly, the disease, the need had brought the group of ten together. It transcended what other differences they had. And it's this Samaritan, this foreigner, as Jesus refers to him, who came back to say, thank you. Jesus' response to him is interesting. He responded by saying, get up, Go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Those are the words Jesus speaks to people who are being healed. But he's already been cleansed. But here Jesus speaks again words of healing to this person. Get up and go. Your faith has made you well, has made you whole. In fact, in some translations, has brought you salvation, because it's the same word in the Greek. Wholeness, salvation. Imagine Jesus, a Jew, crossing that heavy line, that fence, to declare salvation for a Samaritan because of his faith. He received, in reality, a kind of second healing, a full wholeness at the time when gratitude became 
the center of his living. Archbishop Desmond Tutu says that he was cleansed again, this time of a deeper spiritual leprosy, the leprosy of ingratitude. And we see in this story the power of gratitude in our lives. Gratitude is powerful. It's powerful in a couple of ways. For one thing, gratitude enables us to see the world in a new way. To see the world in a new way. Rabbi Harold Kushner says that religion is, above all things, a way of seeing the world. A way of seeing. I believe it's true of gratitude as well. Gratitude is a way of seeing, and it's powerful. To see our world through the lens of gratitude makes all the difference in the world in our, in our lives. G.K. Chesterton, the great British writer, uh, wrote, he said, you say grace before meals, and that's fine, but I also say grace before a play or an opera or a pantomime or a concert or, uh, or sketching, or before sketching, or before painting, before swimming, before boxing, before walking, before playing. I say grace. And before I dip a pen in ink, I say grace. He referred to that as his intoxication before life. We could also call it gratitude in the presence of life and how powerful that is. It gives us this new way of seeing, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. I've shared with you before how much I like Garrison Keillor. Garrison Keillor has a character in Lake Wobegon called Brother Louie. Now, Brother Louie is of the Brethren denomination, not Lutheran. He said Lutheran Brethren, they, he said they all drive Fords, but he said the uh, Brethren have these steel license plate holders with scripture verses on them, he said. And he said, Brother Louie exceeded everybody in his vehicular piety. He had scripture verses on his license plate that were beaded glass, so they glowed in headlights. 24-7, you could see his scripture verses, and he put them on the visors in the car, and even on the passenger window, a verse, the, uh, the earth is full of the glory of the Lord, so that when passengers looked out on the scenery, they were edified by scripture. And he said, Brother Louis did one thing more. He found a company in Indiana that uh, made custom car horns. And so he ordered one that played the first eight notes of the doxology. <laughs> and so he loved to go around. He'd pass somebody and he would uh, hit the horn and it would play, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And he just loved expressing his piety in that way. But sometimes he said he forgot himself and when he would get angry, he would lay on the horn only to hear, praise God from whom all blessings <laughs> flow. And Keeler said it calmed him right down. The power of gratitude to see in every circumstance a reason to give thanks. What a difference it makes in the living of our lives. The Apostle Paul said, give thanks in all circumstances. He didn't say give thanks for every circumstance. That would be weird to give thanks for tragedy, to give thanks for loss, to give thanks for that which is devastating. But he said, give thanks in all circumstances. It is that lens of gratitude that enables us to see life in a new and powerful way. And that gives us a tremendous energy for living. It's an important word for us to hear. Steve McDonald, a New York City police officer who was wounded in the line of duty, was paralyzed. And he was able to say this remarkably. He said, I cannot walk, but I can still be moved. He said, I cannot touch, but I can still feel. And therefore, I'm grateful. Amazing. 
way of seeing life. The famous image of H.W. Beecher of gratitude is that he said, if someone hands me a bowl of sand that has iron particles in it and tells me to find the iron particles, he said, I can move my clumsy fingers through the sand and can't detect the iron particles, but give me a magnet and I can wave it through the sand and the particles will become visible immediately. And he said, an ungrateful heart is like my clumsy fingers moving through the day, unable to find a single thing to be thankful for, unable to see the blessings. But gratitude is like the magnet. And I move through the day with gratitude, and that which would otherwise be invisible becomes visible to me, the blessings of God that are found everywhere. The power to see in a different way. And it is the power to live in a new way. Gratitude somehow enables us to focus on the abundance in our world and therefore to share out of our abundance with other people. Gratitude makes possible a transformation of our world as we become aware that God has indeed given our world everything we need but it's up to us out of our gratitude to make sure that it's shared with those who need it. We see in Jesus also an example here as Jesus didn't ignore the lepers. Jesus didn't turn the other way. He didn't run in the opposite direction, but he looked at them and he gave them the gift of wholeness that they so de desperately needed. He gave them the gift of mercy. Lord, have mercy on us. And he had mercy, and they were healed. Who are the lepers in our world, in our society, in our community? And do we possess that spirit of gratitude that enables us to see the abundance of God and to open our hearts, our hands, our wallets, our lives, our time to share what God has given us. Living out of gratitude makes all the difference in the world, literally. A friend of mine a couple of weeks ago gave me a CD I want to close with the words of a song that's on that CD. Susan Werner is the artist, and she recorded this song on, on, uh, on this CD, and it is a wonderful setting of the song. It's called Help Somebody. And here are the words. I've got plenty, and then some. What will I do? Go out and help somebody have plenty, and then some too. I've got a roof over my head. What will I do? Go out and help somebody have a roof over their head too. I've got supper on the table. What will I do? Go out and help somebody have supper on the table too. I'm going to heaven. What will I do? Go out and help somebody get to heaven too. Why? The chorus says it. Because I've got it to give. And when you have enough to give, it's the only way to live. When we live out of gratitude to what God has given us, we live generously. And we bless others. Not out of compulsion, not out of guilt, not out of heavy demand but out of gratitude. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we are grateful. We confess that sometimes we, like the nine, forget to return and give thanks. And so, oh God, we pray for one thing more among all your blessings, and that is a heart of gratitude that we might see as you would have us see 
and live as you would have us live. In Jesus' name, amen.
these humble gifts and place them to your service. Multiply the impact of these gifts as you multiply the gratitude in our hearts until that gratitude reaches every corner of our lives. We pray this in the name of the one who died for all of us. Amen. If this is the Sunday when you would choose to unite your membership with ours, to unite with this church, please come forward during the sing singing of our hymn of invitation now. Now thank we all our God, found at page 102 of the hymnal. We are blessed to have five new members joining us uh, this Sunday morning. Lewis Ammons, to your left, who stands by Tim, is transferring his membership from the First Broad Street United Methodist Church of Kingsport, Tennessee. Welcome. And we have four young ladies here, Sarah Chandler, Gracie Wilhelm, Marie Wilhelm, and Sarah Wilhelm, who are joining by affirmation of faith. And we welcome uh, all of you as you become a part of of this church, and I ask you, joining by profession of your faith, do you profess your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? Lewis, I ask you, joining by transfer, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? Yes, I do. And all of you, will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. 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 Thanks for being up here. Yeah. yeah. And I invite all of you to come by and give them a warm First Church welcome as the newest members of our community of faith. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen. <laughs>